In this video, it is time to talk about my favorite of the microorganisms. Not because I particularly enjoy studying them or even really the diseases that they cause, but more because I enjoy eating them. That's right, we're going to talk about fungi. It's been estimated that the total number of fungal species exceeds more than one and a half million, many of which have not been discovered yet. But fungi exist in such drastically different forms. You've got everything from this giant mushroom here that to molds that parasitize plants or yeasts um, that are visible only with like a microscope like here. But they also are the most giving of our microorganism species. Humans have been using them for years to do things like make bread and beer. So, and even my favorite, cheese making, even though it's not here. Um, but so all of these things are things that fungi have given us. And on top of that, they've given us kind of dominion over the bacterial world, particularly with penicillin, which was basically derived from a fungal source. Um, very few fungi, probably fewer than about 100, are actually capable of causing disease in humans, are pathogenic. Um, most of them, even the fungal infections that can cause disease in humans are considered to be opportunistic. That is, they cause disease in patients who are immunocompromised. Um, fungi are the master recyclers of the world. They um, are really great at breaking down dead and dying tissue, particularly organic matter. Um, and because of that, some of them are able to cause invasive disease in tissue. Um, Fungi aren't plants. This is something that I think sometimes people confuse. They do not perform photosynthesis to survive like plants do. Um, and because of that, they're able to live in a wide variety of environments. Um, so all fungi kind of exist. In so fungi survive in one of four ways. They can be saprobes, symbionts, commensals, or parasitic. So you'll hear me talk about in a separate visit, uh, video parasites. And parasites and fungi have some things in common. For instance, they're both eukaryotic organisms like us. Um, but much like a virus needs a host cell to grow, that's a form of parasitism. It requires the life of another in order to sustain its own life. And fungi can engage in parasitism. Basically, it lives on or in another host and causes it harm. Um, then there is a group of organisms that are called parasites, and those are basically um, unicellular or multicellular uh, eukaryotic organisms that are not fungi. But let's break this down a little bit further. So saprobes is a very common way that fungi live. And these are fungi that survive on live uh, or on dead or decaying matter. So remember in the last slide, I talked about how fungi are master recyclers. They're part of what breaks things down when things die. And this is kind of a main way they get their food source. They can also be mutually advantageous. Um, they live together in a way that helps um, another species survive, um, promotes the uh, survival of something else. Um, so that, that's a way they can do it. Commensal, they're not necessarily promoting each other, but they live in close proximity. And we already talked about parasitism. Okay, so let's talk about some of the general um, functions of fungi or the characteristics. So first off, as I mentioned, they're eukaryotes. So that means they have a true nucleus and they have true membranes and true organelles, okay? So they have mitochondria, endoplasmic reticula, uh, Golgi, ribosomes, things like that. They all have a rigid cell wall, which is shown here. The rigid cell wall is composed of a proteinaceous structure called chitin. Um, and the chitin can either be paired with glucan or mannan. Um, there is a cell membrane inside, which I've, you know, kind of highlighted here in blue, and that contains ergosterol. Ergosterol is a sterol, not unlike cholesterol, but it is functionally different than cholesterol. Um, but it kind of forms the same function as cholesterol does in our cells. Um, there are the other thing to kind of keep in mind about 
fungi, besides the fact that they have um, this eukaryotic structure, is that they can grow in different forms. So they can grow either as a mold or a yeast, or at least many of them can. Um, yeast is kind of what we, we might associate with um, making bread in the first place. Like if you've ever baked your own bread, you probably added some quick yeast to it. Um, or beer. Uh, my husband brews his own beer and he adds quick yeast cultures to it or grows his own yeast cultures. Um, mold, this is what happens when we leave the bread or the cheese too long, right? Um, where we'll actually see some of those colonies on the actual bread as they grow out. Okay, so this is kind of what I was just getting into. The molds are unicellular organisms that are consist of these kind of thread-like tubular structures, okay? Um, so you've got multicellular, and this is kind of what I'm talking about with these tube-like structures that are referred to as hyphae. Um, they elongate at the tips and that is uh, that process is known as apical extension, which is really just that they're growing out the hyphae, okay? They can form together into like a mat-like structure, and that's called a mycelium. Um, the colonies are filamentous, uh, hairy or woolly, and you probably have seen this before if you've ever looked at, you know, something that's molded over. It looks almost fuzzy, and that's a result of this mycelium, this um, mat that's kind of growing together. Um, and the structure of the molds require knowledge of kind of some specific terminology. So like I said, you've got hyphae, and the singular is hypha. And that's basically just the multicellular thread-like extension. Now, within that, it can do it a couple of ways. It can be septate or aseptate. And that basically just denotes whether or not there is a cell wall between the cells, okay? Um, regardless, cytoplasm is going to flow three, freely. So even though we've got this kind of rigid... Um, structure between the cells here, you will have this um, cytoplasm that basically can just flow through anyway. And it's whether or not you can see this. And this can be helpful for determining the type of organism um, you're uh, dealing with. Yeasts are unicellular fungi, and they reproduce by budding. So when we talk about yeasts, these would be like um, the very small unicellular forms that you see under a microscope. Okay, this is probably the most important concept to keep in mind. Thermal dimorphism. Um, some fungi, not all, have the ability to grow as both a yeast and a mold, um, depending on the temperature that they're kept at. Molds typically grow at room temperature. So that's about 25 degrees Celsius, okay? Yeast typically grow at body temperature, which is about 37 degrees Celsius. And they're able to do this by undergoing a gene switch. The dimorphic fungi are a specific group, and many of them are able to cause disease in humans. So specifically, we're talking about histoplasma, blastomyces, coccidioides, which I'm just going to call coxy here for now, the paracoccidioides, and sporotrix. These organisms, these five families of um, fungi, are all able to cause disease, and they are all able to grow as both a mold and a yeast. Okay, let's talk fungal reproduction. Um, fungi can reproduce either sexually or asexually. So they kind of can make themselves grow in a variety of ways. Imperfect fungi are fungi where sexual reproduction has not yet been identified. That doesn't mean it won't be identified. It just means that right now we're not sure if it can or it can't. Um, we just haven't seen it, which isn't uncommon. So Asexual reproduction, let's talk about that first. This is the process by which yeast divide asexually using spores. The asexual state of a fungus is called the anamorph. 
So this is the type of fungi that uh, will reproduce only by an asexual manner. Now, I talk about spores in the bacterial structure videos. These are very different. There are bacterial spores and there are fungal spores. When we're talking about fungal spores, we're talking about reproduction, not hardiness and survival like we're talking about with bacterial spores. They're very different things. There are two types two general types of uh, sporangiospores and conidia, or conidium in the singular, which contain the structure called the sporangia. So the sporangia produce the sporangiospores, which are used to grow a new organism. The conidia is an asexual propagating unit that is derived from the hypha. So remember the hypha are those projections, right, that we talked about on a previous slide, okay? There are three methods for asexual reproduction. You can do phallic reproduction, budding, or germ type. Phallic reproduction is basically just nuclear fission. That's it, okay? So we're just taking this, we're gonna replicate it, and we're gonna split it. Very, very simple. Budding produces the blastoconidia or blastospore. So in this case, we're actually creating a, um, a budding off of the organism. So it's basically just budding. That's it. It's easy. That's why it's named that. Germ tube looks similar to a hypha, which is why it's sometimes called the pseudo hyphae, but it's not, okay? Because we're, um, we're not necessarily talking about uh, just kind of growth out. This is actually a kind of a structure that forms where then we use this structure to create more um, single units, so more yeast basically. So now let's move on to sexual reproduction. So with sexual reproduction, you're going to have what's called meiotic reproduction, which is basically the fusion of two nuclei. Mating usually occurs between two separate mycelia, okay? So that's when we have a hyphae over here and a hyphae over here, and they come together. That's a heterothallic reproduction. Um, it can occur within a single mycelium. So uh, let me see if I can draw this out. So if we have a mycelia over here, and I'm going to switch colors a mycelia over here. Okay, so these are two different ones, right? And this green one is going to reach out toward the blue one, and the blue one's going to reach out toward the green one. Okay, that's heterothallic. Homothallic reproduction would be, let's say, this is all one, okay? But now this blue one is going to reach toward that, and this blue one's going to reach toward that. Get it? So they're on the same one. The sexual state of a fungus is called a telomorph. Molds copulate at the tips of hyphae, and the hyphae will grow toward each other in response to sex hormones. Uh, it's kind of fungal pheromones. Um, the tips will then blend together, allowing for basically an exchange of information for meiosis and sexual reproduction. And fusion at the tip leads to formation of the zygote, um, and then the sporangium, and so on and so forth. Um, the sporangium then will allow for budding to release the spores to create a brand new organism. Um, just to make everything even more complicated, um, mycologists have created two names for each fungus one for the telomorphic type and one for the anamorphic type. I keep being told in various resources that this is being remedied, but until then, we have to keep learning them. So there are five major groups of fungi that are kind of grouped according to their sexual spore production or asexual reproduction. Um, some of these we're going to talk a lot about in your curriculum and some we won't. So I'm just going to point them out now. You don't need to memorize this now or anything. This is more just kind of an FYI. Mucor, um, in the organism group Mucormycetes, uh, is able to do both sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. Within Basidiomycetes is the Cryptococcus, the coccus organisms. Those are a big important group. We're going to talk a lot about them in the CNS group. Um, Pneumocystidomycetes has this organism. 
pneumocystis giravecchii. Pneumocystis giravecchii keeps kind of changing its mind, or rather we keep changing its mind as to whether it's actually classified as a fungus or a parasite. I believe currently it is classified as a fungus, um, but it has previously been classified as a parasite as well. Candida. Candida is a big one. Um, this is the main cause of yeast infections, but also a whole bunch of other nasty infections that we will talk about. Um, and then we'll talk about pretty much all of the organisms in here, particularly the top four. You've already heard me mention uh, Blastomyces histoplasma. Um, Aspergillus is a main one for particularly lung infections. And then we'll talk about the dermatophytes when we talk about skin. But all of these are able to reproduce um, in specific ways using a different type of spore formation. Okay, identifying fungi is a little bit tricky. Um, fungi kind of tend to be their own thing. So the spectrum of um, mycotic diseases can range anywhere from like a superficial cutaneous disease to a really severe systemic disease. So therefore we really need to know what we're dealing with. Um, and we base this off of a couple main principles. The first one is histopathologic, the second is microbiologic, then biochemical and immunologic. Um, and this is kind of a good rule of thumb for thinking about the different types of organisms you might encounter. Can we see it pathologically? Can we grow it out in culture? Is there a biochemical test that helps us identify it? Or do we make a response to it? Those are kind of the questions you're asking over and over again. So for histopathologic, we're thinking about the size and the shape, which is basically the morphologic appearance. Um, so we have a couple ways we can do this. First off, we can just do a direct mount in saline. Placing the specimen on a slide with 10% um, um, potassium uh, hydroxide um, mount is used to basically lyse any clear cellular elements, either our own, like epithelial cells or white blood cells or bacteria. Um, but it doesn't tend to lyse yeast because they have that nice cell wall. And that can be used to just visualize them quick. Parker ink can also be used. Um, it's actually, ex actually pretty excellent at staining the fungal cell walls. So that's an option as well. Um, we can use gram stain, but not all that often. Um, yeast will stain as gram positive and mycelia will stain as gram negative. So it can be a little bit confusion, confusing. Um, the only thing that I'll say with um, gram stain is that sometimes we use gram stain for um, canidia or ca sorry, candida, um, which might stain as like these really, really big, like massive gram positive cells. Um, India ink. India ink is a particular type of stain that is used for the organism Cryptococcus. So I'll show you examples of that in your CNS or brain and behavior flock. Uh, Calcifloor white is another stain that we can use for particularly candida. It binds the fungal cell wall polysaccharides and fluoresces a white color under UV light. All right, then we have um, periodic acid schiff. Um, this stain sells pink. Um, and then there's also a uh, gamari methanamine silver, which is basically just a silver stain, really good for staining pneumocystis giravecchii. Um, and then there is one more stain. I don't, I, I haven't actually seen this one in a while, but uh, right stain can be used for histoplasma. Okay, again, this is just FYI, don't memorize this table. But the idea is that when we're learning yeast throughout the curriculum, I'm going to tell you things about the yeast form and you're gonna use those as kind of buzzwords to identify that. So for example, histoplasma is small, round, and you can see it both extracellularly and intracellularly. Um, let's see, I'm seeing if there's another one. Uh, Sporothrix has cigar-shaped yeast cells. I mean, that's like a very particular statement that's used over and over and over again. So you could almost make like flashcards out of these um, and then um, use these as methods along with like diagnostic features or symptoms and signs that we associate with certain infections. Okay, we can also do culture. Um, culture is possible, they can be grown in lab with methods really similar to isolate bacteria, um, but they often need to be grown on enriched media. So enriched media would be something like blood or chocolate agar, which will grow a fungus. 
um, really well. However, some fungi are really slow growing and that's gonna require days to weeks of incubation. Um, and it would actually be overgrown by faster growing bacteria in media like blood and chocolate auger, which are very good at growing bacteria. So for that reason, we have some fungal specific media and fungi, remember, these are often saprobes that are really good at eating dead things. So you have to choose media that will have some of the things that the fungi like to eat. So first off, you're going to hold them for a long time, four weeks. Second off, you're going to do paired cultures. Why? Therm thermic dimorphism, right? They could grow a yeast or a mold depending on the temperature. After it begins to grow, you can then use that for that direct examination that we just talked about on the previous slide. So you can use it to do, you know, a KOH mount or um, a calcophor white or whatever it is you're looking at. As far as the specific media, the most noted one is um, Sabarod's auger. It contains glucose as well as other peptones and has kind of a higher pH um, of 5.6, and that's going to inhibit most of the bacteria. Um, other growth media might be things like cornmeal or potato glucose auger or my favorite V8 juice auger, which is literally just a V8 juice. Um, so all of these things actually promote the growth of um, fungi. Um, there is such a thing as a fungal isolator system, which is used to culture from blood. Um, the venous blood is basically lysed and centrifuged, and then the sediment containing all the cellular debris and fungal cells is basically put on a fungal-specific media for the similar four weeks. There's also something known as a germ tube test. This is really only used for candida. Um, it is one of the most common tests when you're presuming that you're dealing with candida albicans. Basically, the yeast colonies are mixed with serum and incubated at 37 degrees for three hours. So it's also a rather quick test for fungi. Um, you're going to look microscopically and you're going to see tube-like structures, which are basically just germinating hyphae emerging from yeast cells. Um, you can sometimes see a false positive with a different candida species known as candida tropicalis, but it's a pretty good test. Okay, so I just talked about these two. Um, serology is actually probably the most useless of the tests we have, with the exception of cryptococcus and histoplasmosis. If you're dealing with those um, particular infections, you might wind up using serology. Um, there is also a um, CSF antigen test that is sometimes used for cryptococcus. Again, we'll talk about all of these tests when we actually talk about cryptococcus and histoplasma. I just want you to have an understanding of ways we might go about identifying them. Um, the last thing that we might do is some biochemical detection. Um, yeasts, particularly candida, can sometimes be identified to the species level or differentiated from other yeasts using biochemical or physiologic assays. Um, the most common is actually a carbohydrate or nitrate assimilation test. Um, basically the ability of the organism to use a particular carbohydrate as a food source. Um, and or a particular source of nitrate. Um, so we can sometimes do that, but it's not as common as what we do with like bacteria where we're looking for catalase or coagulase. Okay, I alluded to this earlier, but really we've got kind of four types of um, diseases that might occur. Superficial, subcutaneous, mucosal, or systemic. Um, Superficial infections are caused by fungi that colonize the keratinized outer layers of our skin, hair, and nails. Um, infections with these organisms, you get almost no immune response. They're typically non-destructive and asymptomatic, so normally we're thinking about a cosmetic concern. Occasionally we'll see subcutaneous. Um, these are for the dermatophytes, which we'll probably talk about like toward the end of your M2 year. Um, these are a very specific group. They're collectively known as the dermatophytes and they invade the skin, hair, or nails. Um, unlike the fungi which cause um, superficial infections, they're able to break down those keratin sur uh, surfaces. Um, so a really common example of say a subcutaneous dermatophyte would be the organism that causes ringworm. Um, which you'll see a lot in like summer months. Um, mucosal infections. So these, many of these are caused by candida um, and lead to yeast infections. 
Um, but we can see them with other organisms as well, and particularly in patients with a reduced immune system, like HIV patients, mucosal infections can actually be rather severe, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about those. And mucosal infections often go to systemic, so they get into the bloodstream and cause what's called a fungemia or a fungemia. Basically, that's just presence of the fungus in the bloodstream. Um, and the way they get there is basically you can experience an infection in a couple of ways. So you can have invasions. So basically like a mucosal infection went systemic. So it ate through the mucosal tissue into the systemic. Um, this is an opportunistic. You can have an allergic or irritant reaction. So for example, aspergillus, our body kind of responds to aspergillus the same way um, people respond to peanuts if they're allergic to peanuts. You get like an allergic or anaphylactic-like res uh, response. There are two kind of other ways people get sick from fungi, um, and that's either an intoxication or a poisoning. So um, anybody who's an avid camper knows you don't eat wild mushrooms unless you absolutely are certain you know what they are. And this is part of the reason. There are some mushrooms that will cause you to hallucinate. Um, and then there are other mushrooms that are actually deadly. Um, mushrooms are a form of fungus. So we're not really gonna talk about these. These are more of, um, these are ac actual ingestion issues that lead to a reaction. And we're gonna focus our intention during the preclinical years on invasion or allergic infections from fungi.